Book of the Playwright, a podcast about creating and sharing new ways to play. My name is Ryan Heyman. You can call me H. And I'm Ryan Quintel. You can call me Q. Now you're really dragging that one out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I need I needed a little different today. I don't know why. <laughs> I I, yeah, I feel the same way. I feel compelled to mix it up every time, but there's only so much you can do with those yeah. exact same words. Yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, last week I finally got around to watching Trolls World Tour. Have you seen this yet? I haven't, although I understand um, the McElroys of podcast fame are are <laughs> in it in some capacity. That's true. They were doing a long campaign for like, put us in <laughs> Trolls 2, just kind of like a jokey joke thing. And so I watched the movie knowing that that campaign had succeeded and they were given a part in the movie. And I was uh, able to pick them out and notice them. And then I looked it up afterwards and actually they played a lot of parts in the movie. I was able to pick out one of them. <laughs> and so wow. I was feeling proud of myself during the movie. But afterwards it was like, oh boy, I missed quite a bit of McElroy in there. <laughs> Geez, I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, I'm. I assume that you know, getting to be when when anybody you know is not officially a part of the Hollywood oeuvre, and they're just kind mm. of going and 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 campaigning to be in a movie. I just assume that they get you know the like the fan cameo, the bit part, the way that you know everyone is technically in the Hobbit movies, that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, I mean that that is kind of the case. It's just that they're given a lot of fan cameo bit parts. And so they aren't like substantial characters, but they do pop up like frequently throughout the movie. Anyways, uh, the the reason I brought it up is because watching that movie, it's very, very obvious that the person who, I guess, conceptualized that world was a huge Brutal Legend fan. <laughs> and it makes me very really? happy. Like That's about as close to a Brutal Legend movie as we're going to get. And actually, there's quite a bit of overlap between that movie and the uh, Brutal Legend sequel that we pitched on playwright a number of years ago uh gosh what was it called it was oh, harmonia legend or something like that yes. it's one of the very early episodes but um it was a. Uh, it's just very interesting like you know obviously this uh kind of the baseline idea of having different nations represented by different genres of music and how they would interact with each other it just felt very familiar and it made me think you know if i if that is kind of one of my like dream video games that like someday I would love to actually, you know, have that get made. But now I wonder, like, would people think that I'm ripping off a Trolls World Tour, even in though mm. I came up with the idea first? I mean, technically, we're both ripping off of Brutal Legend, but um, <laughs> I'm OK owning up to that one a little bit more. <laughs> That's just the way it is, as they say. But anyways, I, I recommend the movie. I thought it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was a good time all around. So if uh, if people haven't checked it out yet, it's free on Hulu, or I guess as free as anything on a subscription services. Um, so you don't have to pay the, what, $20 that it was when it first came out on streaming. It was, I think, like the first big movie to release. I don't remember if it was just on streaming or if it was like streaming in theaters at the same time while things were still closing down. But uh, people were a little, I think, a little curious about the $20 price tag on it but um mm. uh you know it's just the way it had to be at the time uh since it was essentially kind of a movie theater competitive feature at the time yeah uh, yeah we've all so, been learning yeah. in this pandemic including new ways to monetize <laughs> the pandemic haven't we it's interesting to see like that pricing structure hasn't really stuck because mulan came out for twenty dollars in addition to the disney plus subscription mm -hmm. I and thought they released were it for pretty 30. skeptical. Oh, is it 30? Yeah, they, I think they you're right went about big. that. <laughs> yeah, and that movie didn't end up being all that great, unfortunately. Um, that is free on Disney Plus now. Tenet came out in theaters and on streaming and Blu-ray Blu -ray release at like around the same time, I think, because he was really holding out for a theatrical release and delayed the movie multiple times, but um theaters never really opened up again mm. or if they did it was it was not like a wide release like he had been you know wanting yeah and I, and I, from what i understood like i think nolan the way he he's kind of got his movie set up now is he like either takes less pay for like a piece of box office but he structures it around box mm. office take and so now 
obviously he has a huge incentive of like, no, damn it, this thing is coming out in movie theaters, but who's going to see it? You know, what a joke. I was thinking back, what is the last movie that I saw in theaters? I think the second to last one that I saw in theaters was Godzilla King of the Monsters, which if movie theaters never open again, that would have been a great movie to go out on. Like seeing this incredible Godzilla movie on the big screen is such a great swan song to the movie theater experience. But I think thinking back, it turns out my actual last movie that I saw in theaters was Pixar's Onward, which I liked, but it's not like, it's not the same kind of story to tell your grandkids, you know? It's not like, yeah, I saw Godzilla King of the Monsters on on theaters. Uh, <laughs> you know, Onward is like, it's a movie that's just as good on a TV screen. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, uh, I I think also I heard some statistic that the average size television now in an American home is something like 55 or 65. You know, it's a massive TV, you know, where our, it's like our theaters took out all the stadium seating and tried to put in recliners to make them more like a home and our homes increased the yeah. screen size and quality to be more like a theater. And, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, uh, obviously, at the end of all this COVID stuff. But I would love to see and love to support a transition of movie theaters into more of a, you know, locally owned business with really, I mean, I, I will pay yeah. the ticket price to go see even an old classic, like go see The Exorcist again. Some art house movie theaters still do this yeah, stuff, totally. but that could, that could be everywhere. I like those kind of prestige movie theaters. I've always wanted to rent out a theater mm. for my annual Star Wars holiday special viewing, <laughs> uh, but I've never pursued it. One, because I don't know, it seems kind of expensive and like, I feel like I couldn't make my investment back because I couldn't probably technically sell tickets to it because like licensing and everything, <laughs> it seems super illegal. But uh, I mean, if there was just kind of like a cheap kind of locally owned, you know, theater where I can rent it out for, I don't know how much these types of things would cost. But it'd be super fun to just get like a theater packet full of people and watch the Star Wars holiday special. Obviously can't do that now, but um, maybe someday when the world goes back to normal, itchy and lumpy, just like we have always dreamed of. <laughs> yeah, I can finally go back to enjoying too salty popcorn and being a, both mm. too stick stuck to the recliner and too cold all at the same time. Let's go to our video game pitches for the day. Um, I'm going first today. And I'm not going to lie, this is not a great pitch, <laughs> but over the past year, I've probably played more side-scrolling 2D beat-em-ups than I've ever played before. And there's just kind of a few things about the genre that doesn't click with me just yet. Mm. You know, I, I feel like the biggest thing for me is that like the depth perception is really difficult. Sometimes you feel like you're punching somebody and the punch will either go kind of like completely behind the sprite in a way that it's like, I don't know, feel. And then like when you're punching and kicking and attacking traditionally in those kind of 2D brawler beat-em-ups, you're kind of locked in place. And so if you do, you know, just kind of barely miss one of your enemies, then you're kind of, you know, feet glued to the ground for a little bit. And it that just kind of feels bad. Um, I've seen how the genre has evolved into the 3D space, you know, you can see things like Bayonetta, where there's kind of a one-to-one -one translation of the kind of 2D brawler format mixed with a lot of the kind of stylish uh, improvisational work that 3D uh, modeling and, and motion tweening of 3D models um, allows them to do. Uh, Devil May Cry, even, you know, even games like... Uh, what is it, Ninja Gaiden or the Senran Kagura games, the games where you're fighting kind of multiple people at once. Uh, uh, Dynasty Warriors is kind of an extension off of that genre as well. And so I feel like we've really gotten it right in 3D. But, and again, this is, uh, it feels bad to, to say this, but like for me, it hasn't landed in 2D yet. And I know that people absolutely swear by Streets of Rage last year, Streets of Rage Four from last year, and um, you know Scott Pilgrim versus the World just had a re-release. Yeah, Battle Toads had a new iteration last year. Like we're kind of in a heyday of two D brawlers, but they're not really working for me just yet. And so I'm curious if we could just take a stab at 
kind of fixing the things that I don't like about beat up genres, not necessarily to imply that there's anything objectively wrong with the genre or that the genre as a whole needs to change to cater to my tastes. But um, I imagine I'm not the only one who feels like this. And so if there was kind of an alternative branch to the genre that could really suit people like me, I I wonder what could be done. So I'm going to start the clock there. I actually think I share... A lot of your criticism with the genre, even even as somebody who grew up playing a lot of uh, 2D beat 'em up, to beat 'em ups rather, Streets of Rage one and two. Mm-hmm. My brother and I were late to the original Sega Genesis or Master System, whatever people want to call it, and um, but we got that <laughs> that legendary like six in one game pack that was a pack in with the Genesis at the time, <laughs> and Streets of Rage mm. was on there as well as Golden Axe was on there. Let me ask you this. Are are all the problems that you have with these 2D brawlers m- shared by 2D fighting games? No. That was my suspicion. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing is like the depth perception. Yeah. It's like a big problem for me. And I know like it seems the easiest solution to that is just remove the depth of field and just kind of set it on a 2D plane. But then I'm kind of worried that we don't differentiate ourselves enough from like Ninja Gaiden and uh, Contra and kind of side scrolling mm. platform or action games. I think one of the, maybe one of the angles here is what if we had our, our 2d brawler, but it was a little bit more on rails or on tracks. And I don't mean like the levels always advancing, but rather if we could kind of tap up and down up the stack in the way that you could in actually the early mm. 3d mortal Kombat games or the Tekken where you kind of step forward and angle okay. on the plane or, or, you know, sidestep. Cause then I think you could lock in what is happening in the characters that are on those rails. And of course, every bad guys, good guys can jump between rails. But once you are locked on the plane, you could at least have that fighting game level precision of things feel like they're connecting and you're not yeah. like, Oh, I'm, I just punched past his head. How was I, how was I to tell in this stupid game? You can have kind of a, a grid system like a Mega Man Battle Network or something like that. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then certain certain attacks could um, could have kind of an area of effect that it, uh, actually one game in particular. Speaking of Mega Man Battle System, uh, Battle Network rather, a game that takes inspiration from that Mega Man subseries was uh, Ickenfell last year, which is a two D like a JRPG with a battle system reminiscent of Mega Man Battle Network in that everything takes place on kind of a elongated grid Mm -hmm. and each of your attacks has kind of a certain range of effectiveness. And so you would have to kind of position yourself on the grid in such a way that that you put the enemy within your attack radius. Sometimes you're trying to specifically exclude allies from that attack radius. Um, So, I mean, we could do something very similar to that, but not turn-based, you know, something that is more kind of real time and, and reactive. Yeah. What I, what I like about the idea of the, uh, especially the grid is if the grid is, if you do like a, almost like a, I, I've got Hitman on the mind a little bit, but hold down the right bumper or something to actually see the grid overlay, but mostly had it pretty subtle on screen at any given point, you could still get that kind of being surrounded feeling. But as you enter into these quadrants, you should like, I like the idea of I'm actually playing a 2D fighting match against 10 easy opponents. All were easier than I guess one significant opponent kind of all at once. Then, you know, I think another problem from 2D 2D brawlers is characters will overlap on each other. And I guess maybe a great player can be like, I know exactly that I can punch this group of people in this way and they will all fall. But whenever they stack Mm -hmm. up on top of each other like that, what happens to me is I'm murdering half of them and then one of them kicks me from the stack and I can't tell uh, what's going on. Yeah. And so I think if things were kind of contained onto a grid that it would, it would at least kind of visually clarify like what you can and can't attack and everything kind of feels more fair in that way. I think to keep grid based movement feeling like it maintains momentum, like a good way to do that, kind of the obvious way to do that is to set it to like a musical beat. 
in which case we actually probably get pretty close to uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer, because uh, mm. that's a very similar thing as well. Like every character has a certain uh, danger zone that they're moving into. And, um, you know, obviously it's kind of an auto attack uh, in that case, rather than the more kind of like finesse fighting game button combination types of attacks of a traditional 2D brawler. But, um, you know, it it does become kind of like an order of operations of, you know, stepping out of the square that your enemy is attacking, moving to attack them on the side, predicting where they're going to be in three beats turns uh, set to a musical beat, which again, is like another game that I'm not like, I don't fully get along with. Uh, what, Crypt and the Necrodancer? Yeah. <laughs> you just can't be contained. That's your... <laughs> or yeah, I know, wait a minute, where yeah. you do want to be contained, but that they kind of have the opposite <laughs> issues of each other, which is funny. Yeah, a little bit. I think the thing that I... Uh, we Taking that 2D brawler, going the grid-based, being able to do things like... the There's always like a throw move in these brawler games. Well, these, you mm-hmm. could throw someone into an adjacent quadrant or into an adjacent cell and Mm -hmm. that is how you can get your enemy bunching and that sort of stuff but you've got to you know maybe like you said it's like a double tap or something to kind of jump or you have to jump to jump from grid cell to grid cell but once you're mostly in a grid cell there's a tight sort of alignment there and i'm thinking like i know battle network is more intended for a different screen format but in 69 you could have these cells all feel like little fighting planes even if there's a little bit Mm. there i think you you dress it up also let's let we can make the characters 3d get them into the next dimension make it feel more like dragon ball fighters but with that sort of maybe super smash brothers many many enemies like uh feeling because the the stuff in smash when there's a ton of enemies on screen and they all have uh you know they're all very weak health wise i think are are very fun and a 2d brawler entirely in that format could really work this kind of reveals a lack of understanding of the genre on my side but um like i think brawler games are meant to be played very similar to fighting games like to the degree that they can kind of straight up rip characters out of brawler games like final fight and put them into they can become Street Fighter characters later on. They could become Marvel versus Capcom fighters r- later on with, you know, very little kind of translation work. I've myself, I've never really kind of unlocked the full potential of like the combo system in a brawler as much as I have in a fighting game. But um, I, I expect that the depth is there, but I just haven't, uh, haven't gotten my mind around it yet. Yeah. Hmm. I don't, yeah, I don't really know what to do with that. I think the other thing that that like 2d brawler like there there must be something between that between that perspective and i i know at some point a couple games have attempted this something between what we get with the streets of rage and a more isometric sort of top-down game i'm thinking of the most modern example might be like the ascent but this is the angle that you find like a path of exile or an action rp or early action rpgs and and there must be something between those two things that just unlock the right level of feeling like that genre, but clearly giving you um, more of a 3D-like purview and agency over the space. Yeah. I mean, even something like a uh, Gauntlet Legend. Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. For some reason, that sounded wrong coming out. Gauntlet Legends <laughs> or even a Diablo has elements of the the beat him up in it kind of constrained to a isometric field as well i think the game but, director um, of gauntlet legends also said there's something wrong about this coming out but uh <laughs> sorry no unintentional well no i don't mean to burn gauntlet legends that bad but dark gauntlet was, dark uh, legacy for the life most fun that you could have waiting at a red robin <laughs> wait a minute, are, is always that, had one of those machines out is that still is that gauntlet legends that i'm thinking of i'm thinking about dark legacy was legends the arcade one Legends was an arcade. It also came out on N64. Okay, that Dark is the Legacy, good one. Legacy, I think, was the sequel to that. Yeah, there. what was the new one that came out that was just terrible? I think there was just one called Gauntlet that came out recently. Yeah. Like within the last six years or something. Well, I shouldn't even say terrible. Maybe I need to go give it a chance, but I, I, it seemed like nobody spent any time with yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> we would have heard something if it was yeah. any good. Anyways. That's enough time on that one. Let's close it down. Let's come up with a name for a brand new beat-em-up 
uh, franchise. We have streets of rage. Do we need like alleys of anger? Let's just say like alley haters, like alligators, but it doesn't, I don't know if it fully comes through. Is there uh, something off of alley cats? Could we have a- alley, alley spats? spats? Alley spats. <laughs> That's it. You <laughs> cracked it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, that'll make me laugh every funny. time I hear it. <laughs> All right, what are you bringing us today? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still in alley spat space. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> my pitch today is I I wanted to go big, and I maybe I've got something here, maybe I've got nothing. I would like to talk through, think up stuff around a real Mass Effect trilogy sequel or a sequel trilogy. This is the episode. Four, five, six, the true four, five, six, forget about Andromeda, of what we would do with Mass Effect. And I've got some rough stuff, rough kind of plot here, but certainly we can talk through other parts of the game. I like the idea of being in, first of all, do you know what happens in one, two, three? I know what happened in my one, two, three. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Um, So I like the idea of um, playing, because we have to pick a fake canonical ending, right? So we're playing post Mm -hmm. this universal explosion, everybody's isolated, and there is a planet of people who have been overtaken by the Krogan. Now that there is no genophage, the Krogan have become kind of dominant in a place in the galaxy. Your people are super oppressed. They, the, the Krogan are not treating them well. Um, and this is all they, all they know is that this is the fault of the shepherd. And so we go Terminator style and we send our new main protagonist back in time to stop Shepard from ever happening. Uh, so there is no explosion. There is nobody to reverse the genophage, all that sort of stuff. I think, you know, roughly I'm like three parts is part one, you're back in time. You actually stop Shepard from killing Saren. Part two, Saren becomes the big bad uh, where you, you maybe you start off like teaming up with Saren, but then he turns on you and he's responsible for bringing the Reapers back or something like that. So the Reapers come back. You can kind of hit some of those beats, um, but Saren thinks he can control the Reapers. He can't. And then in episode three, you have to team up with Shepard and kind of restore the timeline um, and end the Reapers again. All right. Starting the clock. So we have kind of a time travel going back in time to kind of re-examine the events of the past, interfere in some ways. Yeah, it's like, what can you do with things that are terrestrial, go extraterrestrial, and then once you're extraterrestrial, really all you can do is go through time. So this is like an attempt mm-hmm. to go, let's just go to the inevitable time. I think it's interesting. It gives us some interesting building blocks to play around with. But the one thing I kind of don't like about it is that it still kind of focuses all of the, I guess, narrative momentum around the original trilogy. And I feel like a lot of series kind of fall into a trap of people fall in love with a certain cast of characters, and then the rest of the series just won't leave those few people alone, even when they've built out kind of a big galaxy. I mean, Star Wars is the famous example. Like, everybody has to be related to somebody that we already know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it just makes the world feel very small. And I kind of appreciated Andromeda, I mean, completely just leaving the universe that we knew and going off somewhere completely different and yeah. really kind of cutting all ties with everything as we knew it and just kind of going off of the the kind of the lore of the galaxy as it as it was. Um but if we were to go back in time, I would want to find like a really different angle so we weren't just experiencing the same events again, some way to kind of recontextualize maybe we can only send our consciousness back via certain conduits like maybe maybe we're able to send our minds backwards and they end up in those like robotic ant aliens that we just kind of genocided in the first game yeah or i don't know some kind of ironic twist well uh, one of the things that i've gosh going back a couple episodes now but um one of the things that i think is so clever about cobra kai as a series is and fans had really done this, but like the fan reading of the karate kid of like, maybe Ralph Macchio is the bully. 
there are scenes in Cobra Kai where they recut the movie and be like, oh yeah, this actually makes, you know, the karate kid come off as kind of a dick. Uh, hmm. So the idea, right, of, you know, players, it, it really there's two things that I'm like interested in um, potentially doing something with, which is players made, some people played Paragon, some played Renegade, but even in Paragon runs, you have to make a couple of tough decisions. Shepard has that thing that we see in Hollywood over and over again, which is that fallacy of just like, well, if you give the right people the uh, the purview to to break all the rules, then you yeah. know that will result in good things. It's just all about having the right people, whatever that means. Yeah. And so I I do like the idea of maybe there's a uh, Saren, there's an alter read on Saren where he has ulterior motives, or he wants to, or he knows something about the Reapers, and he's um, you know he's got a plan or something in place that he's able to convince you of. And then the second thing is, is could we, through this trilogy, do something to retcon the, uh, you know, the ending of Mass Effect 3 that everybody was so unhappy with, even mm -hmm. after the updates? Like, is there a... They've already retconned it once, so... <laughs> right, <not> right. It. <laughs> so it's clearly in flux. But yeah, I wonder if, like, maybe somehow with your intervention or you being partnered with Shepard that... The choice becomes less binary or uh, it can be shared or distributed in some way. I, I don't know, but maybe there's a way to to actually do something different there. But yeah, I mean, I was going to get into just kind of pitching like mechanics and mini games and things, but I definitely am down with a different narrative. What if kind of like I said earlier, we're not able to fully physically go back in time. We're able to send kind of whispers of our memories back in time and have some level of influence over the past without being fully in control. And maybe the conduit of this telepathic kind of time travel in a way is Legion. And that's what sets him apart from the other, I don't remember what the robot species was called, but um, you know, he, he remarked kind of throughout this um, kind of latter half of the series that he didn't really even understand why he was sentient when the others weren't. Uh, he didn't understand where the sentience came from. And maybe that can be kind of retroactively explained by this message being sent from the future. And we're kind of seeing things from Legion's perspective. That's interesting. Wow. Or, or, oh man, now you've got me thinking of like, what if a sequel trilogy, but you're, you're playing as the Reapers, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, is there... Is there a read to be had of like you ha that like the, the universe just I mean, that's the whole cycle of Mass Effect, right? Which is the universe just keeps it's like the Matrix. It keeps getting into this pesky state mm -hmm. and inevitably you need somebody to come and clean it all up. And that's what the Reapers have been doing. Uh, tale as old as time. But yeah, is there does that mean we could could we go inside the Reapers and find out if there is, you know, learn about them as a species and get involved with their politics. Maybe you become a person who, you know, is a voice of dissent and saying like, I don't think we should keep doing this. Like it, we, it clearly isn't working. We can't have to keep doing it. Um, and could you be, you know, so one of the high beings that maybe seems like a God initially, but you are, you're cast down into corporeal form, uh, and have to kind of take the side of the, the people that live in the galaxy. You could be playing as a human character. The main antagonist are these kind of like, I don't say lower level life forms, but like things that are smaller, like they would be like insects to us. And they're the ones that are kind of conspiring in various planets and stuff throughout the galaxy. And you have to kind of travel around and take out this threat before it infects your uh, kind of higher level society. And then towards the end of the game, it's revealed that you are the reapers everyone sees themselves as being human or whatever it kind of calls into question what the humans if they're even really you know human or whether we as the players are projecting our own expectations onto the characters and i would just love this kind of like this kind of reveal that maybe you are you're the bad guys of the original trilogy you're working against your own because then like if you feel threatened in the sequel trilogy, then you kind of understand the perspective of where they were coming from. Some of the things I have kind of down here, I guess, just 
kind of getting them out, I was thinking about like, wouldn't it be fine? I mean, one of the things I think Mass Effect sorely was missing in its um, space opera a la Star Wars was let's get some space combat in there. You know, EA has that squadrons team that just put out a pretty decent, you know, flight game and they done, they did it with mm-hmm. battlefield. I would love to see some actual space battles happen in a mass effect. I, I, I like the idea of not only, you know, learning from the past, you know, 13 years of games and the way that Assassin's Creed Valhalla, not only do you have these kind of like personal loyalty quest also involves you solving you know regional problems on a planet and um i think you could do you know you could use what ubisoft has done with like the assassin's creed of like planets can be these mini open world spaces that you actually go and enjoy maybe the size that they were in the mako but actually filled with more interesting things to do and that sort of stuff yeah i mean that's the dream let's uh let's go ahead and close that one down and let's give it a subtitle. This would be Mass Effect. Can we think of anything more interesting than four? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I said yeah, but I don't know if yeah. Uh, we had Andromeda. What do you do? Do you think of, uh, there's something to like? What do they say? You sow what you reap. Is there like a reap and sow or something like that? This could be Mass Effect recursion recursion yeah that sounds sci-fi i like that um okay let's go to our community and see what y'all have written in this week we have another submission uh to the website from our friend jason sd who says hi h and q first i wanted to say how glad i am that you guys are still going strong i took a break from podcast for a while but recently i've been catching up uh recently i enjoyed episode 184 Awesome. That's a, that's a recent one. Uh, if you've been taking a break for a while, then of course you can hit them in any order. That's not a topical show. And so maybe we talk about topical things every once in a while at the top of the show, but, um, yeah, a, uh, you can listen to them in any order at any time and they should be just as relevant. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the hope. Onto my pitch. Mm, sorry. Onto my pitch. This idea comes from movies and novels that are that so often depict a scout's head on a pole. Is that a thing that happens a lot? Like uh, a boy scout or anyways, let's, let's read the rest of this pitch and see where it goes. That de- so often depict a scout's head on a pole. I thought how terrifying it would be to play a scout knowing that could be your fate set in a fictional medieval time. You belong to a village displaced by an invading army. The enemy is in close pursuit, pushing your group further into unknown territory you play as one of the scouts. Your goal is to travel ahead and look for safe routes and hunt for food. But what will you find? Raiding pirates, dangerous beasts, and can you return with enough food and supplies to keep your people alive? All right, starting the clock. So we, I think what what is being talked about here is like just that that iconic imagery of people like people whose heads end up on spikes because they were the scout or they were the first of their group to like get to a place it's kind of setting as like a warning okay so if you're the the first into an enemy encampment and the enemy wants to send a message oftentimes they'll mutilate the the scout or something like that so i think it is an interesting this is literally shooting a messenger so you know in action games most of the time like it makes the most sense to control one character even if it is set in a kind of larger army environment and this will often be like You'll be a special, you know, super powerful character. Like in a Dynasty Warriors, you'll be the one that can really tear through the enemy units and you're the general or in a MOBA and you are the hero unit and you're supported by an army of minions. But in, um, I, I think in this one, what sets it apart is that you are not more powerful than anyone else. Yeah. You're really kind of, you're, you're almost less powerful because if you were, a better fighter than you would probably be in the in the lines of infantry. Uh, so you know it, it is kind of a survival stealth. You know, stay hidden, try to kind of like read the environment and figure out. And like bringing information back is really how you can score. You know, you aren't mm-hmm. an assassin sneaking into the enemy camp so that you can assassinate their leaders. You are maybe taking photographs so that the army can go in and you know with the power of 
a thousand men can bring down a city, whereas they might not to be they might not be able to otherwise. And so, you know, you're really not relying on your own power. You're relying on the information that you can convey back to the army. I think one of the things that I it's almost like playing as a hobbit uh, for your party in Lord of the Rings or something where, you you know, you you can't really fight. And that that makes it to me a stealth game. I guess The Last of Us kind of does this, but you're you I do feel like in The Last of Us, you're still pretty high up on the power curve. Um, I know they designed some situations to not be like that, but. You know, at some point you become, either through upgrade or something, a pretty capable person. And I, I like, almost what if stealth, but outlast, where, or, or alien isolation, where, yeah, you're, you're stealthing about, but, you know, all you can really do is hide behind that tree or that bush, um, and, you know, you're peeking out occasionally to hear some dialogue or to take a photo and capture intel or use your binoculars or something. But I like that tension of kind of having to peek out, see what people's radiuses of them looking around, really having a game. I feel like stealth games are so bad at this uh, now because they're far more about mechanical signals as to whether or not someone can see you. And it, it, it's very rarely like we've all played a stealth game of like, that guy's looking right at me, but he can't see me. Well, what if when they look at you, they can see you? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going all around in circles here. But the idea of playing horror as army stealth, I think that's both a setting, a mechanic, and uh, a a tension feeling that is a combo that you know maybe Jason's touching on here hasn't really been done. Another aspect of this that I find pretty interesting is you know if you are a scout, a lone scout going into dangerous ground the rest of the army can't count on you ever returning. And so they're going to go ahead and do their thing. You know, they're going to keep marching. You know, they can't keep Mm. an army of a thousand people waiting for one person who may or may not come back and, you know, can't be sat down for two whole days waiting for somebody. And so you have to perform your task kind of in real time while the army is marching on their way. And so maybe you have a map of their intended route, but... This is um, this is a time before you can instantly communicate. You know, there's no walkie-talkies, there's no cell phones or anything like that. There's no GPS systems, and so maybe your map shows in real time where the army should be, but they can get slowed down by battles. They can get diverted by traps and stuff like that. And so maybe along the way, you can take notice of those things and in your mind kind of come up with like where you think the army is. But, you know, if you scout far ahead and then come back and the army isn't where the mini map says that they should be at this time, like it's really your responsibility to find them again and deliver the information. Otherwise your whole mission was for nothing. You know, you got to give them that uh, advantage or they're just going to get slaughtered in the next round. Yeah. I, I think that's cool. I And I even love the risk reward of maybe you do have your radio, right? But but when you start getting closer around an enemy camp, you got to turn it all the way off or else someone is going to hear that yeah. thing and you're going to be found. But also while it's off, you can't hear about your own troops movements and plans and where they're headed yeah. and if they're taken off without you. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so the, uh, The scoring system, you know, it's not a high score chase game, I would imagine, Um, but everything essentially does come down to like numbers behind the scenes that translate into whatever it means in the game world and story. But essentially, maybe there are kind of a set number of objects or hidden entrances or uh, troops waiting in, uh, waiting to ambush uh, along canyon walls or something like that. Like there are a certain number of things that like you really should photograph and everything that you do means that your army loses fewer soldiers um, in the, uh, in the run up to, you know, the next battle. And so, you know, that increases your chance of um, succeeding in the next battle. Maybe there are certain kind of high value targets that you would photograph so that you can like really, you can show 
guard routes or where a general lives, um, things like that that can be very useful. And so, yeah, you're kind of scored for like what you notice and what you don't notice along the way and how well you're able to photograph that in a way that kind of communicates, that has landmarks, that has uh, all the useful information that your army can use to, you know, and maybe it's a very smart system as well. Like if you photograph a, you know, like a ramp up a rock wall, like the game has that object tagged and will know you photograph that because you want your army to climb up that rock wall to use it as, you know, a higher ground or something like that. Like, you know, you, you can be, um, it, it kind of encourages you to photograph kind of obscure things, but the game knows what you're after. I guess no game would ever be able to like fully predict, you know, even if everything was kind of appropriately tagged, like gamers will always surprise the programmers and the designers with, uh, using things in ways that they weren't intended to be used. Yeah. I, and I, that kind of gets me into thinking about some of the things Kojima did with Death Stranding, right? And infrastructure building. And mm. is there is there something about the way you photograph and tag and, and kind of categorize these things where you can you can say, hey, you know, if you if you let me go back to this spot with, you know, three engineers, we could maybe stand up a bridge and build that thing, you know, without necessarily being seen by the enemy uh, army, but you know, you run the risk of being found and potentially losing all these engineers on maybe an Oregon Trail like permanent journey. Anyways, that's enough time on that one. Thank you very much, Jason SD, for sending that one in. Let's come up with a name. We find ourselves with another war photographer, which we've done multiple times on the show. So <laughs> let's see if we can come up with a scout. <laughs> Like Scout's Honor kind of fits as well. <laughs> Scout's Honor. That's pretty good. I was actually thinking like if you go, if you do some sort of narrative around it and if you set it during like a World War II or a time where, you know, really people were pretty, mm -hmm. they weren't exactly checking ages on IDs maybe as thoroughly as we uh, we would today. Okay. If we did, if we just called it like Charlie, which could be both, you know. Obviously, Charlie is the name of the enemy, but the name of the character. Okay. Would that be, um, what does that have to do with not checking ages on IDs? Oh, I'm just thinking Is Charlie like, sneaking into a lot of bars or something? <laughs> no, I just like the, uh, yeah, I, I, you're right. I totally didn't explain what I was thinking there. I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, the face of this, I'm, I'm trying to think about who would best be, embody the helplessness or the you know the lack of power and you go for a young kid who you know he's just quick on his feet and he's relatively light mm, on okay. his feet and he's charlie and he's scouting charlie <laughs> scouting charlie all right cool i think that uh i think that fits and please don't um, let the game end with his head on a stick now i feel now i'm attached if you would like to submit a video game pitch of your own you can do so by going to playwrightcast.com slash pitch you can email us, playwrightcast at gmail.com, or you can tweet us at playwrightcast with your own video game idea that we will discuss on the show and workshop into something feasible. That's all we promise. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? Some, some weeks we, we can't even promise that. <laughs> Special thank you to Protodome. For a hundred and what, you know, if 87, 86 episodes. This is uh, 89, 189 now. 189 episodes of uh, our theme song, Hello World, off his album, Blue Noise. And thank you to the other even longer running shows um, like the Canon Rinse podcast and Sound of Play and the Sausage Factory. You guys, it, we keep saying it, but you got to check these shows out. They're really great. And to take us out of the show today, let's uh, go for another redacted game, a game we like to play here on the show, where we read the Metacritic description to a game with pertinent details redacted, as you would see on a government memo, and the other has to guess which game we are describing. All right, this week, Redacted is a redacted-style action platformer set in a magical redacted-inspired world. The game draws its inspiration from traditional redacted culture and folklore, and features many interesting and unique characters. 
Redacted builds upon the classic open-world Redacted style of games by adding strong Redacted combat component, a new Redacted switching mechanic, and cooperative, same-screen multiplayer for the entire story. The game also blurs the boundaries between Redacted and platforming by making many of the Redacted useful and necessary for both of these. So, an open-world style game that is building upon a universe and inspired by a particular culture and it's a yeah i mean maybe just from traditional redacted culture and folklore okay 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 and it has multiplayer same screen co-op i'm nervous for this game because i can't i can't necessarily point to any one well maybe i can but like i i'm thinking about (laughs) what the heck it feels like to reference any culture in a game that in a video game period, but I guess especially like a platformer. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of games that come out of specific cultures that use a lot of their own kind of cultural signifiers. So, you know, it's don't necessarily think that it has to be like weirdly appropriative. Same screen co-op, same screen co-op. There's like no games that have same screen co-op now. I, that should really narrow it down for me. And it doesn't sound like a Mario game. I don't, I don't think any, any Mario's mess with any particular culture. I mean, Mario is based on the uh, traditional Italian culture and folklore. So. <laughs> yeah, how can we forget? You know, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't remember until I replayed some of Mario sixty four uh, that he mm-hmm. snores and then says spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like it's almost racist, but I feel like. I don't feel like any Italian person would really care. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I guess maybe everybody's been there. Everybody's been there. Okay, so, okay, there's a same screen co-op game. Man, man, oh man, oh man. And it's based off of a culture. Uh, be, before I even make my first guess, I could I get some piece of metadata? Just because I, I, I need, I'm I'm thinking about like... This seems like it would be a console game, but I'm not sure. Okay. I think before I give you all of that useful of metadata, I'll start off by saying that it has a 90 meta score and a 7.7 user score. Oh. I would say that neither of those really surprised me that much. And it's, uh, it has co-op and it has platforming. Is this, hmm, (laughs) Is this a Divinity Original Sin uh, game? No, it's not from the Divinity Original Sin series. I guess that may, yeah, that's not a platformer. A platformer? But an open world? What the hell is that? Is this, um, I'm trying to think games with that would specifically use an art style and a culture, and one of them that comes to mind is Guacamelee. Is that a, a guess, or is are you just saying that like, that's something <laughs> okay, that comes to I mind? Guess. Um but I, I don't know if the original Guacamelee had co-op or if it was just the second one. I'm going to say Guacamelee 2 because uh, I know that one has co-op. <laughs> uh, funnily enough, it is not Guacamelee 2, but it is in the Guacamelee series. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. well, technically that could that could be severed as well, technically. But I'm going to uh, guess. It's not severed. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to guess from your chuckle. That, that is guacamelee wow yeah specifically this was the description of the super turbo championship edition um unredacted it says guacamelee is a metroidvania style action platformer set in a magical mexican inspired world the game draws its inspiration from traditional mexican culture and folklore and features many interesting and unique characters guacamelee builds upon classic open world metroidvania style of games by adding a strong melee combat component, a new dimension switching mechanic, and cooperative same screen multiplayer for the entire story. The game also blurs the boundaries between combat and platforming by making many of the moves useful and necessary for both of these. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I first played <laughs> Guacamelee. It's one of my favorite platformers. I first played it on the Vita, and I remember mm-hmm. just... I was living in New York at the time. It was one of those games where I, the Vita was still pretty new for me. And I just, instead of going to sleep that night, I just laid, uh, <laughs> laid down and played Guacamelee basically, um, until I beat the damn thing. It was so good. I was really thrown off by calling it an open world. I don't, 
I guess all Metroidvanias are technically open world, but yeah, I was going to say like open world platformers, like, you know, Hollow Knight and Ori and the Wheel of the Wisps, like I would definitely describe them that way, but I didn't want to give those specific examples because that would kind of point you right to it. (laughs) Right, right, right. I guess, and Hollow Knight is even something that if somebody told me, oh, that's based off of a a cultural art style, I would, I would probably buy it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, guacamole oozes culture. Yeah. And it oozes internet memes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for better Memes words. that were dated at the time of its launch. <laughs> and they doubled down in the second one. They really did. I think they did a little bit, like in Guacamelee 2, there were still some kind of like topical humor, but it was a little bit more like, it felt a little bit more broad and a little bit less yeah. like specifically internet memes, but there was a room or like one of the other dimensions that was like full of the internet meme signs from the first game. And a bunch of messages about like, this is in poor taste. <laughs> yeah. Like kind of making fun of themselves for having done it or maybe making fun of the people for complaining about it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Still one of my favorite gags I, from number two was the, one of the dimensions that you go into and it's just the guy who bought a car and all you do is like, yeah. uh, destroy the car. But then they, don't they do like a street fighter a bit with that as well? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was um, I think it was like, I mean, it was clearly set up like that Street Fighter 2 minigame. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that was the initial thought going into it. But I think maybe the first time through you didn't destroy his car or I, got, I don't remember. There was some kind of inversion on the expectation that was set up. Um, yeah. I'm not remembering exactly how that joke played out. <laughs> anyway, go play both of those, everybody, if you haven't. Anyways. Uh, yeah, good game. That is Guacamelee. Thanks everyone for listening to another playwright this week. We'll catch you again next time. Bye.